Before we formally start, I'd like to welcome and thank my fellow panelists who were uh, so kind to join me in this webinar. First of all, there is Eva van Stijvoort. She has a bachelor degree in midwifery and a master's degree in health education and promotion. Um, she obtained her PhD in 2022 at the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Law at the KU Leuven, and she presently currently works as a research manager under the supervision of Pascal Bori, and her current research mainly focuses on ethical and social aspects of new developments in the field of reproductive and public health, with a specific focus on trustworthy AI tools for the prediction of obesity-related vascular diseases. And I also like to welcome uh, Claudius Griesinger. Claudius has a neurosciences degree from the University of Tübingen. He did his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for De Developmental Biology, working around molecular mechanisms of neural network development in visual cortex. He did a postdoc at University College London, where he worked on ultra-fast uh, synaptic transmission. Before joining the European Commission, Claudius was an assistant professor for physiology at the University of Freiburg. But presently and since 2006, he has been working for the European Commission Joint Research Centre, the JRC, where he first worked on biomedical testing methods, contributing to the OECD guidelines and coordinating expert advice and stakeholder dialogue. From a uh, 2015 to 2022, he was uh, responsible for the JRC's contribution to the implementation of the medical devices and in vitro diagnostic regulations, focusing on signal detection, emerging technologies, including a topic of today, artificial intelligence. And he set up expert panels on high-risk devices now managed by EMA. Since 2022, he is a member of the leadership team of the JRC's project portfolio on innovation in life and health sciences. And with that team, he focuses on AI in healthcare and medicine and on innovative cancer treatments. So two people who are very well posed for the topic of this uh, symposium, or of this webinar. But first of all, I'll share my screen. Before I formally start, there's a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, this webinar is recorded, uh, so if you don't agree, I would need to ask you to leave. Uh, the recording will be made available within a few days on the website of the CoreMD um, Consortium. All participants are in lecture mode, which means that we cannot give you the floor for oral interventions, but we do welcome questions and interaction. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, tab for that, and after the presentations of the three of us, we will provide answers during the discuss discussion phase. If we don't have enough time, we will do that in written format later, and you will find those answers in the recording that will be made available. If there are technical questions or urgent questions during presentations, you can always use the chat function and Jean-Baptiste uh, who is present in the background, uh, will help solving those. If you're interested in CoreMD and haven't yet uh, connected to the consortium, uh, please subscribe to the newsletter and follow us on social media. We had a fourth speaker actually today, Bernd Grimm, uh, from the Luxembourg Institute of uh, Health Department of Precision, but unfortunately he had a reschedule of his flight back from abroad and he isn't able to make it uh, today, but I think we will have plenty of topics to discuss and I hope that the content of this webinar will be of interest to you. I also want to mention that this is a webinar in a series of webinars organized by the Core MD and that the upcoming webinar will be held on November 6th at the same time as today, 5 p.m. Central European time. And the topic is a review on cardiovascular and diabetic uh, devices, as you can see here. Uh, the moderator will be Robert Byrne uh, from uh, Dublin in Ireland. 
And uh, the two topics uh, will be on high-risk cardiovascular medical devices, quality and transparency, and uh, on high-risk diabetic medical devices. So turning to the topic of today, um, we are in work package two of the consortium task 2.3, which was set up to develop guidance for the evaluation of artificial intelligence and standalone software in medical devices. I was the lead on this topic, but we had a consortium, uh, which I'll show in a moment, helping us to uh, work towards this task. We had actually two phases in the task. We had several meetings, of course. Uh, we started during the COVID, so most of them were online. Some of them were physical, uh, entire groups of group discussions. And in phase one, we had a background text uh, that we uh, converged on with the position of the consortium on relevant topics, so a little bit the principles. And we had a publication with review of definitions, expert recommendations and regulatory initiatives to which I'll come back in a moment. Then in phase two, we develop practical recommendations for the clinical evaluation of AI medical device software. And we had the deliverable a report on that topic, uh, which was uh, delivered in uh, March of this year. But we continued working uh, organizing a Delphi with clinicians to validate the results of our work, which we finished in August of this year. And we're going to have a second consultation round now with regulators and notified bodies, which is upcoming. And we will have a presentation to the Medical Device Coordination Group of the EU on November 8th of uh, this year to continue the work. So the first part uh, of our um, of our study was a text which was uh, published in Expert Review of Medical Devices with Alan Fraser, the coordinator of the consortium, uh, as the lead author. And we developed several things in there. First of all, we looked at definitions. And actually, um, there are many around. And they're always a little bit different. I think there's a, some sort of a convergence today on the definition which is uh, put forward by the OECD and which reads a machine-based system that can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. So that's a high level definition and it can, um, it can really hold a lot of things from very simple mathematical formulas um, algorithms to all of the intrinsic machine learning that is happening today. If you look at machine learning and AI, uh, and this is really a topic that Alan Fraser is very keen on, he says it's actually nothing more than uh, an, a fancy statistical modeling. And indeed, some of the techniques that are used in some of the words are novel under machine learning, but they are similar to uh, a large extent. Um, on the other hand, there was a very recent publication in the New England focusing on the differences between machine learning and, and typical statistical models. And you can see that here. Um, the, in this case, it's a hands-on, it's curation of data. There's an underlying expert judgment. It's a stable process. The conclusions are reproducible, auditable, auditable and verifiable. But the downside is it's hard to scale to very large multimodal or high dimensional data sets. On the other hand, an AI model can ingest a very broad number of data uh, sub, uh, subsets. It can handle those easily or certainly, but at, in some cases, not always, it remains an opaque process and the conclusions are sometimes harder to reproduce or audit. 
when we did the survey of the definitions and of the, the regulations on uh, medical device software, there's obviously a difference between what is happening in the EU under the medical device regulation, which covers both software and hardware, versus the IMDRF, which is really focusing on software, and the FDA, which has different uh, legislations or regulations for hardware and software. There's many other differences between the FDA and the EU. I won't go into detail, but I'm sure that if there are questions about that, we can discuss them later on. What is a case that even if you look at it from the Western world, there's a lot of institutions, a lot of bodies who are working on AI and even if you try to keep track of it every week, there's practically a new development, a new text, a new initiative. So it's really difficult to see the forest for the trees. Uh, and I think a lot of the smaller groups also within academia have a trouble to finding their way in this uh, field. There's a lot of initiatives in the EU, and there are several still ongoing. Uh, of course, because AI has to ingest data, the General Data Protection Regulation is an important one, but the AI Act, the European Health Data Space, the Data Governance Act, there's several other ones that are still uh, being worked on that have an impact in this field. So when we're looking at all of that, uh, some of the conclusions of that first text was that there is a real risk for overregulation and risk adversity, that standards should be based on scientific evidence, not just on technical facts, and that they should be proportionate to the clinical risks. And we will come back to that. There has to be a concordance of scope and regulatory uh, requirements. We hopefully and ultimately it would be preferred to have global regulatory convergence rather than just within Europe, the UA, or for that fact, a very important uh, player today uh, is China as well with their own recommendations in this field. They should really, or we should try to uh, focus the regulatory uh, efforts on methodologies for clinical investigation, because clinicians will only use devices they trust, and I'll come back to that. And trust is not just the technical aspects, but also the clinical validation of them. And uh, this is a presentation that was given recently during the Summit on Regulatory Science um, that was held uh, in September. And of course, there's no the large language models that are um, coming in that have been really swiping the world in many fields, will probably, if not inevitably, do so in medicine as well. And we really need to be prepared to deal with them in a similar way that we have to deal with every new technology uh, in medicine. But it is a challenge for sure, because the field is moving so rapidly for the moment. Then in the second phase, uh, we prepared the text of, as a report, as a deliverable uh, for the advice on regulatory evaluation of machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, software. We first set out a couple of principles, and I'll uh, go over them and come back on some of them later in, in my talk. As I already mentioned, there are regulatory needs and they're very important. Let's be certain about that. But there are also scientific needs that need to be um, fed because otherwise the trust from clinicians and patients will not be there to use them in real practice. Of course, it's always the balance that needs to be kept between being too prescriptive and too generic. And it is a difficult one to hold because in a lot of cases, AI software will be very dependent on the context. And so it needs to be adjusted to that context. On the other hand, if you're going too generic, then you're all only raising principles and those that has been done uh, to a great extent already, and so there is no need to repeat them. 
What is very important, and I'll uh, focus on that uh, further on, is that we think that we need to be risk-based. But that doesn't mean that we need to go to zero risk. Zero risk, in my opinion, is impossible. It's also impossible in the rest of medicine. There's no nothing or nearly nothing that we do in clinical practice that carries no risk at all. So we always have to balance risk and benefit, and benefit being, of course, from the perspective of the needs of the patients. With respect to AI, there's the important part of explainability. And explainability is, in that sense, uh, important that a lot of people say that AI that is a black box cannot be used. I don't agree with that, but it think that when you have a black box type of AI, you need other types of validation testing than with uh, crystal box uh, type of uh, topics. I can always give the, the example, when you look at uh, drugs, there are some drugs that we don't really know how exactly they work, but we test them in the population. When they do what they're supposed to do, we use them. And I think that can hold for black box type of AI uh, topics as well, but certainly a topic for discussion. What is important and what is maybe not so very well in the MDR today is the fact that we need to look at usability and acceptability by individuals, patients and caregivers. You can have a perfect system, but if it's not used by uh, the ultimate uh, stakeholders, it doesn't help anyone. And we have to move from what I think is more like a waterfall system where you produce and test everything and then just drop it in practice to a more agile approach where we can go back and forth and adjust the system according to its real uh, world use. This is the black box versus white box and that holds for um, AI itself, but also when you use data driven research combined with modeling research, that same spectrum is holding. We always or were tempted to compare the things that we need to do in AI with the development in drugs and the development in devices. And of course, there are similarities, but there are significant differences as well. And I think one of the major differences is that AI in healthcare will change according to the way that it's being used, uh, from the context in which it's used, the purpose might shift during its use. So I think that there needs to be more emphasis on the post-release phase than with devices and drugs, which do not or hardly change uh, when released to practical um, to the practical system. And that holds as well for the um, for the way that we uh, evaluate them. Here you see the different phases of preclinical, small scale, large scale and post market. Uh, for surgical innovation, there's the ideal stages that work there. For drugs, we also have the typical uh, phase one, two and three and pharmacovigilance. There are similar stages and we will focus on uh, the entire life cycle of a AI device in uh, this perspective. So what did we come up with principal solutions? We are in agreement that AI is not totally different from devices, other devices, regular stats and, and other software, but that it does have specific features, risks and challenges. Therefore, we are going towards a risk-based approach with a scoring system that will follow these four aspects. Two of them you will recognize from the IMDRF, which is the disease and the significance of information, but we include also usability in the clinical workflow and human interpretability, so the human in the loop or the human oversight aspect. And of course, because data is at the basis of a lot of the AI development, quality and transparency and validation of the algorithm is of utmost importance. Then depending on that risk score, we use the MDCG 
2020 document on guidance for clinical evaluation, and we created a matrix for the requirement of that evaluation, which can be um, defined as the ability of the AI tool to yield clinically meaningful output in accordance with the intended purpose in the pre- and post-market phase. This means that we propose a partial but significant shift to a post-market surveillance because of some of the things that are already mentioned. There might be a shift in user perspectives and capabilities. There might be a drift in the target population that is unavoidable and sometimes even desired. There's adaptive learning in many of the AI tools that can be stepwise or continuous, but it's happening. And if you want to go back and validate the system completely in the typical MDR way, you will only be revising and not using. And I think some of the typical applications of AI will be for personalized use, which means that you would have to validate the tool for one person, which is totally impossible and impractical. That means that I think we need to go, but it's a term that the EU doesn't really have in the MDR to a sort of conditional release. Uh, but in our uh, work with clinicians, we certainly need that conditional release to be very carefully documented and tested to exclude high risk categories from such a release, because the first thing in medicine is do not harm. So we do not want to have tools being delivered to uh, the clinical practice that are potentially harmful and where the risk benefit is disadvantageous. What we do think is that in comparison to the FDA, there is less emphasis on manufacturer characteristics. The FDA is proposing some, um, let's say, accreditation type of, um, of procedures for the companies that produce medical device software. We do not think that that is the best way to go because it risks excluding some of the academic features, small and medium enterprises and startups, and that in this setting, only the really big companies would be able to go through such a procedure. Of course, in the background, there's always the uh, principles uh, and 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 uh, desirable things that we know from the World Health Organization, the six principles for AI in health. And one of them that we certainly need to keep in mind is sustainability, the impact on the environment of, uh, of all of our computers and service centers that we are using for AI training and use. Uh, transparency, explainability is important, and you can see them here in this six star. The other background that we should not and cannot forget is, of course, the EU ethics guidelines for trustworthy artificial intelligence. But I leave that to Eva if she wants to focus on those, but these are obviously important. One of them is human agency and oversight, which I'm not so completely agreeing with, that always oversight is possible and needed. But again, uh, I think we can keep that for the discussion. Also, the OECD has a framework for classification of AI systems, which is really very similar to what I've been saying. And here as well, people in the planet. So the focus on patient needs, true needs, and the environmental is at the core of that uh, setting. But let's now turn to what we uh, propose in somewhat more detail. First of all, we think that a key thing to focus on is transparency. Transparency in everything that we do. And for that, we use this triangle. Uh, where we have external transparency, internal transparency, and insider transparency. What we mean by external transparency is the information that the healthcare provider needs to give to a patient or a citizen, if we're talking about prevention, on risks, benefits, alternatives, as with everything that we do in medical practice. To be able to do that, that healthcare provider needs information from the manufacturer of the device, in our case, the software, and 
guidelines that are produced by scientific societies uh, from the different medical fields. This information from the manufacturer, for example, is what we call internal transparency. They need to produce that and to be transparent about the data that they have, the validation, the verification that they performed for their software. And then you have the inside the transparency, which is the information from the manufacturer on safety, performance and security and the regulatory uh, needs that need to be done, including cybersecurity. So that is really the core things that the MDR is looking at. It's partially looking at this, but I think that this part is also important and it's, married, it's really bringing together the scientific and the regulatory aspects of the entire system. Here you see this in, uh, in another uh, form. It's safety, performance, and security, regula regulatory affairs. Here you also have scientific evidence and HDA, which is reimbursement insurance that we're not going to talk about today. And then we have the patient and the impact on society and human rights at the top of it. Now to provide that transparency over this entire field, we need to do risk management. We need to provide state of the art, that is to be able to show that what we are bringing to the market is offering an, an improvement on what already exists, but we keep, have to keep a balance between innovation and bringing too fast to the market things that are not validated and clinically verified yet. And on the other hand, we need to process and design the performance, which is really the backbone of the insider transparency. Here you see some of the aspects of that, uh, and I'll briefly go into that. The state of the art is the treatment alternatives, the current medical practice and affordability. The process and design is really good machine learning practice, the IOS, uh, IEC rules, etc. And we'll go mainly into this field where we are talking about risk benefit and the clinical performance of the tool. For the process of the design, you need good machine learning practice. I won't go into that. Uh, it's something that uh, is very important by itself but it's not part of the clinical evaluation. If you're talking and focusing now on the risk benefit balance, um, we have to define the risk. And if you look at the MDR, it's simple. All of medical devices and certainly the AI tools are in the high risk category and they're permitted subject to compliance with the MDR. But that leaves us with no leveling. Uh, it's all high risk. We have the IMDRF, which is using two, um, two fields, if you want. That is the situation of the patient or the condition, if it's a critical, serious or non-serious condition. And if the um, tool is only informing, driving clinical management, or is in, for example, a closed loop where it is directly treating or diagnosing. Depending on the convergence of this, you have here class 2A, class 2B, or class 3 devices. Actually, IMDRF has uh, done this many years ago and are now revising this uh, field, uh, but that revision is not yet available. So what we did is we try to create a simple risk scoring that takes that clinical performance and the, uh, the two um, aspects of the IMDRF scoring system into account, the type of disease, the significance of the information, and we give them a simple score. But we also take into account the technical performance, where that depends on the type of validation, if it's external, narrow external or only internal validation. And we are, have defined these various points. And ultimately, 
We um, also take into consideration the clinical association, the transparency in oversight, where we go from a easy oversight where it is an algorithmic, where the uh, supervising clinician or healthcare provider can easily ascertain if the tool is providing what it is supposed to do to a complete black box situation where that is impossible or nearly impossible to verify. So according to these various uh, aspects, we give scores and we use a flow chart, a flow chart where we use the clinical, the technical and uh, the uh, VCAS where we uh, score, use the scores to provide, to define either an extended level of clinical evaluation at pre-market or a lower level of clinical evaluation of pre-market. So the goal here is to have a simple flow chart with a simple scoring system that would advise us on whether and to what extent the evaluation, the clinical evaluation has to happen before the tool is being released to clinical practice. Another thing is that we want to go not just for the aspects of the pre-release and the AI modeling itself, but the entire life cycle of the AI tool, which includes the planning and design, the data input, the model built and used, the verification and validation, deployment and integration, the pilot evaluation, so the small scale clinical trial, the larger scale clinical trial, and the long term operation and monitoring. So those are the different phases that you recognize on this slide by their color code and their names here. We defined substages for each of these and for the extended or the limited evaluation, we defined which had to be provided in the pre-release phase and which had to be uh, provided in the post-release phase. So it's really trying to establish a system in which simple things with low risk, with a large benefit to risk ratio are coming to clinical practice and can be used and tested in real world afterwards without uh, having risk to the patients or the healthcare providers using them, while the ones that have a higher risk and a lower benefit risk ratio have to go to more extensive and more extended evaluation before they can be released. To make this practical, we have a extended questionnaire list, which try to uh, enumerate all of the aspects for each of these phases and substages that need to be answered uh, by the manufacturer of the tool. It's a whole thing, and there's obviously a lot more detail in the text that we provide, um, and that is a text of, of uh, more than 70 pages that will be released once uh, we go through the regulatory advice that I mentioned in the beginning. We already did a Delphi-like procedure with clinicians, uh, to validate the recommendation with practicing clinicians and to propose ultimately improvements to that recommendations. And I can tell you, we had two steps in the Delphi process and there were many uh, improvements suggested that we incorporated in the text, uh, which was uh, really important to have that input. And one of the major points that were, came about is to avoid bringing any device, any tool to market that could hold a significant risk to patients or healthcare providers. This is a type of uh, questions that we put in the Delphi, and then we had the threshold of to see how many um, would pass, and if they passed the threshold of 80%, we would agree. There were some that didn't reach that threshold, and there we did a second uh, round. That's where we stand today. I hope that I've been able to give you some insights in the overall um, principles. I do acknowledge and understand that I could not provide you with all of the details, but I think that uh, in the discussion, if you have specific questions, we could uh, go into that. So it's now my pleasure to ask Eva van Stijvoort to give her presentation on the ethical aspects. Thank you for listening.
Um, so thank you for the kind invitation. So uh, today I will be talking about more general ethical challenges uh, of AI-driven uh, healthcare. Um, so we know like all new technology, AI holds uh, a big potential for improving the health of, of millions of people around the world. But also with all new technologies, uh, there's also room for misuse and potential harm. Uh, AI can be applied to almost any fields uh, in medicine, um, and it could potentially also contribute to biomedical research, medical education also, for example, but also delivery of healthcare, uh, and the potential seems limitless. Um, in some high-income countries, um, it's already being used uh, to improve also the speed and accuracy of diagnosis and screening for disease to assist with clinical care, etc., uh, AI could also empower patients to take greater control uh, of their own health care and better understand their evolving needs. could also help to bridge gaps in access to health services in more um, low or resource poor uh, countries and rural com communities where patients often have more restricted access to healthcare workers or uh, medical professionals. However, we should always also be cautious to not overestimate the benefits of new technology, and that also uh, applies to AI for health, um, and to not dismiss challenges or problems that AI may introduce. So many challenges and risks uh, also arise when thinking. Um, um, many of these challenges have been also raised previously when other uh, information and communication technologies were introduced in healthcare. Uh, if we think about uh, ethical uh, issues, it could be the unethical collection of certain health data, but also biases encoded in certain uh, algorithms, but also um, risk related to patient safety, uh, the environment, etc. Um, so the central question, and I hope this works now. If we think about ethical challenges, and uh, Professor Rademacher already uh, mentioned it, is how to balance risks and benefits. So how can we improve the efficiency of healthcare delivery and quality of patient care? And how can we at the same time avoid and limit threats to privacy and confidentiality, informed consent, patient autonomy and patient safety? So um, Professor Adam actually also uh, mentioned them and I want to uh, dive in a little bit deeper during my presentation on key ethical uh, principles for the use of AI uh, for health that have been proposed by the WHO. Um, these principles have been proposed to limit the risk and to maximize the opportunity, uh, opportunities that are intrinsic to the use of AI for health. So these principles, um, and I will go in uh, to that each one by one, uh, can be very important for all stakeholders that uh, are involved in the development, deployment, but also the evaluation of AI technologies uh, for health uh, who seek guidance when doing so. So these principles are grounded in four basic ethical principles, and I think these are probably known by most of you, of course. First, do no harm in, in, uh, in medicine, the non-maleficence, -malefic sorry, so to avoid harming others, but also doing good, the beneficence, like promote the well-being of others when possible. And then again, there uh, you have to um, balance the expected risks uh, against the expected uh, benefits. Uh, so you would have to minimize risk and maximize uh, benefits. Then justice, also a very important ethical principle. So everyone should be treated fairly uh, and to ensure that no group or specific person is subject also to discrimination, manipulation, uh, neglect, domination, uh, or abuse. And then finally, also autonomy. So uh, you should always deal with persons in a way that respects uh, their interests in making decisions about their lives. Uh, and this also, of course, includes healthcare decisions. So if we think uh, about the principle of protecting autonomy in the context of healthcare, this means that humans should remain in control of healthcare systems. That's the standpoint also of the experts uh, that wrote the WHO report um, and medical decisions. Um, they should be able to override decisions made by AI systems. And I think it's, it's important um, while I was also reading the last couple of weeks and months since we started also on our project on the AI-based risk prediction, uh, I think a very important thing here is also to understand how it's um, 
how it works, the explainability, but also is there enough clinical evidence also? Um, so at the moment, like there are studies that have proven that AI is as good as a healthcare professional in making uh, decisions, uh, but the, the general idea or uh, um, view is still that healthcare professionals at this moment should still be able to override uh, decisions made by AI systems. Um, so at the moment, the general view is still that AI-driven uh, technologies should be designed to assist in making informed uh, decisions about certain uh, medical decisions. Um, this principle of protecting autonomy also entails, of course, the related duty to protect also privacy, confidentiality, um, and also, um, again, the valid informed consent uh, of uh, patients that patients should be uh, give. Then the principle of, um, sorry, the next principle uh, is all about yeah, not harming people, of course. Designers of AI technologies should satisfy regulatory requirements for safety, accuracy, and efficacy uh, for well-defined uses uh, or indications. And specific measures should really be in place to ensure quality control, uh, but also quality improvement to ascertain if the AI driven systems are working as designed, um, but also to ensure or detect any uh, negative effect on uh, specific individual uh, patients or groups. Uh, and if they are identified, of course, to uh, act to avoid this from happening in, in the future. Then the next uh, principle of transparency and explainability um, was also a concept that Professor Rademakers um, mentioned. So it should be understandable to developers, users, and regulators. It's not always easy, but I think transparency uh, here really requires that sufficient information uh, is published or documented before the design or uh, deployment of a certain uh, AI technology. This should include information uh, about the assumptions and limitations of the technology, uh, operating costs, properties of the data, uh, and the development also of um, the algorithmic, algorithmic uh, rhythmic model. Um, so it's important that this information is always accessible. Um, to allow also a meaningful public consultation and debate. Um, furthermore, information should also be tailored. Eh? Like if we talk about explainability, uh, and they always, always say when uh, uh, we talk about explainability, that it should be tailored according to the capacity of those to whom uh, the explanation is directed. This could, of course, lead to a possible trade-off be between full explainability of an AI algorithm that you completely know how it works at the cost of accuracy and improved accuracy at the cost of explainability. Then the principle to foster responsibility and accountability. Um, although AI technologies perform very specific tasks most of the time, it is the responsibility still of all involved stakeholders to ensure that they are used under appropriate conditions uh, and by appropriately trained people also. Um, again, effective mechanisms should be available for questioning and for redress for individual and groups that are uh, negative, negatively uh, affected by decisions based on AI algorithms. Um, if we talk about uh, the principle of responsibility, um, it's of course possible that you have a certain diffusion of responsibility yeah, where everybody's problem becomes no one's uh, responsibility. So there, um, um, a collective uh, responsibility has been proposed where all actors involved in the development and deployment of AI could be held responsible, uh, which people argue could also encourage all actors to act with integrity and to minimize harm when uh, developing and deploying also these uh, new technologies. Um, then finally, the um, there's one more. The, the principle uh, to ensure inclusiveness and um, equity is also a very important one. Uh, so inclusiveness requires that AI for Health should be designed really to encourage the widest possible equitable use and access, irrespective of 
um, specific characteristics protected under human rights codes. Think about uh, gender, age, uh, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or ability. Um, effects of the use of AI technologies should also be monitored and evaluated. Uh, including also disproportionate effects on specific groups of uh, people, uh, biases, unintended uh, moves of the times that should be avoided or identified and mitigated. Uh, if we think, for example, at a system that has been designed to diagnose uh, skin lesions that is trained on data with uh, on only one skin color, this might not be um, possible to use this uh, for patients with a different skin color or increase their risk, um, uh, health risk, if it's being used for them also. So AI technologies should be always be adaptable to context and needs of different settings and try also to avoid the uh, enlarge an existing digital divide. Uh, and this is within countries, uh, if we think about high income countries, but also between countries. Um, it's also something that has been uh, um, mentioned a lot also in the report of the WHO, for example, um, where there is an, an enormous potential for low and middle income countries, but it could also possibly lead to an increase of the digital divide if uh, people are not investing in also all the um, communication structures and technology uh, that is needed to um, implement these technologies. Um, we should also think about uh, minimize the inevitable, in a way, power disparities. Think about uh, the power disparity between patients and providers. So everyone should be able to benefit from technology and not just the techno technology providers or developers. Um, also, the, the point has been raised a lot that we should focus more on information technology literacy. Uh, if you think about patients, um, it's almost unavoidable that this is going to be implemented in healthcare. But I think we should also work on technology literacy so to help patients understand also more uh, what is coming. And then also what has been mentioned is that um, as, yeah, as if possible, and it's uh, preferable that open source software should be used. Uh, and also source code um, should be made publicly uh, available. So the last principle um, about responsiveness and sustainability. Uh, so there should be monitoring, of course. This should be continuously, systematically and transparently. Designers, developers, but also users should continuously um, and transparently assess these applications during actual use to determine whether AI responds really adequately and appropriately to um, expectation, expectations and uh, requirements. Um, the use of AI technology should also be terminated as soon as possible if it's necessary, if there are really negative um, effects. Um, AI systems should also be designed to minimize their environmental uh, consequences and increase energy efficiency. Uh, when we think about climate change that is happening, the ecological footprint. It's also something that uh, is being mentioned uh, quite a lot in these uh, in this literature. Um, and governments and companies should also address anticipated uh, disruptions to the workplace. If we uh, think about um, if we want healthcare professionals to use this, there should be training, of course, appropriate training that they can use it also in a correct way but also potential job loss um, if some tasks uh, in healthcare are, uh, and I think worldwide there's a shortage at the moment, but if um, some uh, tasks are being automated and people lose their job, this is also something that should be anticipated um, before um, yeah, and during the uh, design. So um, for those that want to read more, I can highly recommend uh, the guidance uh, that the WHO has uh, published in 2021. It, uh, it's a very good, I think, overview. Um, it has been a work of almost two years of a group of experts, so I can highly uh, recommend it. I also want to just take one minute. I don't want to go over time, but uh, one minute to say something uh, about the project project that we are involved in. It's about trustworthy AI tools for the prediction of obesity-related vascular diseases. So we are uh, also, again, thinking about ethical 
challenges apply to this specific uh, topic then. Um, but the, the aim here is to develop both a citizen app and a clinical decision support system uh, that is based on an AI-driven uh, risk prediction score where both clinical laboratory uh, imaging data but also lifestyle data will be used to, um, to yeah, to make the algorithm. Uh, so the citizen app is for patients uh, with obesity uh, to allow them for self-determination management of their health, but also for personalized uh, risk monitoring. Uh, and the clinical decision support system will then be more for uh, the clinicians, the healthcare professionals uh, to help them manage and um, make treatment decisions based on the risk prediction scores. So thank you for your uh, attention. And then I will now give the floor to the to last speaker of today. Yes. Thank you very much, um, Eva. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm My name is Claudius Griesing. I'm jumping in a little bit on short notice here. So I'm really, really pleased to, to be here this afternoon. And um, I will give you a presentation, uh, some reflections and actually some insights in an ongoing work, um, which I gave recently on one of the meetings that Frank also mentioned, it was the Global Summit on Regulatory Science. Um, it's really exciting to see actually what's going on in the Core MD um, um, project, and also to hear from Eva a very excellent summary of the the, the um, ethical principles um, outlined also in the WHO document. So I'll share my uh, screen or. Give you the presentation now. Let me see. I hope that works. So, okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So, uh, the title of this presentation is An Evidence Pathway for Trustworthy AI Innovations in Medicine and Healthcare Bridging the Gap Between Developer and User Communities. Now, uh, just very briefly at the JRC, we have um, um, a new way of working, which is um, uh, being tried out at the moment, I should say, or it's quite serious, um, which is um, that we grouping port, uh, projects basically from very different uh, places in the JRC, uh, where people support DG Santé, RTD, Connect, or we're working on, on basic research also to some extent, and bring that together in so-called portfolios. And one of the portfolios we, we have is the innovation um, in life and health sciences, which I co-developed with some, some colleagues and, and I'm co-leading. And what we're trying to do here is to, to address some health challenges um, and also some technological drivers and look at the actually, actually uh, the innovation life cycle from anticipation over assessment, state-of-the-art benefits and risks into translation. So uh, an emphasis really of our work is to help with the translation of innovation into practice. And AI is a very useful field in that regard. We are having a lot of um, um, good ideas, uh, small companies also coming up with, with tools, but the translation is often a problem in the EU that is not always that excellent. I'm coming to this point a bit later. We're also interacting with other portfolios um, on trustworthy AI and on cybersecurity and others, but these are the most relevant ones for this talk this afternoon. So we're focusing in our small team on artificial intelligence and medicine and healthcare, cybersecurity in that context in innovation, um, innovative health technologies for cancer. So what I want to show with this very busy slide is that we had an enormous development, of course, if you follow this very simple scheme here from cybernetics to cognitivism, to connectionism um, from the 1940s and so on in the area of what is called artificial intelligence. And it's always has been a very, um, very interdisciplinary field. I mean, starting with McCulloch and Pitts. Pitts was a logician philosopher. McCulloch was actually a, a neuroscientist. And they were really fundamental with inventing, so to speak, the McCulloch-Pitts neuron at a time which was similar um, to Donald Hub coming up with the organization of behavior and this fun, very, very foundational rule, which is very simply summarized by neurons that fire together, wire together, which is um, was a theory at the time, but actually turns out to be a lot of truth in it if you look at the brain development. Over then the Cambridge-funded Dartmouth conferences and the cognac, uh, cognitivist 
paradigm with people like Noam Chomsky, Marvin Minsky, who changed his tune a little bit later, and philosophers like Hilary Putnam with the functionalism. And then actually something happened um, quite early on in a way that people got inspired by neuroscience and by the self-organization of especially the cortex uh, with some feature detectors. Most prominent uh, known example is the ocular dominance that you have different areas in the visual cortex that respond to either the left or the right eye. That's not necessary for seeing things in relief in three dimensions or the orientation pinwheels that you can see here. And that self-organization um, was tried actually by Frank Rosenblatt very early with this perceptron machine. I invite you, if you don't know about it, read about it. It's very, very interesting. Actually, he tried to, in a way, set up a machine that was a little bit like a retina, but he could train it actually to recognize visual patterns. So that's quite long ago. But what we have now, of course, is we have a real revolution with the neural networks. And that actually has also an effect to some extent on explainability. And um, I come to this in a, in a moment also, and to some extent, um, Frank already has provided uh, some views, I think, that I will probably echo in this presentation. Now, we have continuing innovations, of course. There are huge multimodal data sets in principle. We hope we will be able to set up the European health data space. You know it was kicked off this year. There's a lot of data science progress, and of course, there are new computing techniques also around the corner, so to speak, maybe not quite there, but it's coming, like quantum computing. And health, of course, is a very, very data-centric discipline. So if you take this all together, there is really a revolution around the corner. And of course, it's important to, as we already heard, to uh, balance the opportunities versus the potential risks. Um, very briefly, just to also emphasize artificial intelligence, there is this nice um, definition by Marvin Minsky. I just showed you his name. Science of making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by man. It's both. It's an interdisciplinary scientific field, has been for a very long time already, but it's also, of course, a technology. And there it's important also to, I think, to look a little bit at different um, techniques that we have. We have the symbolic AI, which is basically really programs that are written with rules that use knowledge base. You have inference engines can be very powerful and quite sufficient for a lot of questions already. But then we have the classical machine learning, but it's a bit like statistical modeling. We heard that earlier. And then we have something which is quite different the neural networks where you have basically virtual neurons that are connected have some weighing factors and can reinforce their connectivity in, in, in response to, to data and input and basically learn. Now, there are also hybrid approaches and that makes it, of course, quite complex. But on the other hand, probably you don't need to always understand in the last detail how these things work. Important is, of course, that there is transparency at the end how these things set up and especially also what information has been used to to, to um, build these artificial intelligence systems. There is a big discussion on transparency and especially explainability. And I just put a lot, a uh, few papers out here. I mean, it's true there is not even a real uh, a consensus on the concept of explainability. I think it's a little bit, people have very different ideas if they talk about explainability, to which extent explainability, what, what it actually should address. Um, some authors have, like Gazemi here in Digital Health, Lancet has um, put forward the point that it's actually a false hope to, uh, to, uh, to hope for complete explainability. And others, of course, have argued that it's something that's really important. We would argue at the time being that um, while there are lots of efforts being made also in regard to explainability and new mathematical approaches for explainability or approaches that are old actually, but apply to artificial intelligence like the Fourier transformation. Maybe it's better to start a few level lower, few levels a bit lower and actually really look what is really going on in terms of um, the transparency, the, the study design, data pooling vocabulary. We made an observation in a uh, systematic review we did on COVID-19 detection artificial intelligence systems that really the studies were designed in such a different way that it was impossible basically to put the data really together and also there was quite a bit of confusion from one study to another on on the vocabulary used so i think there's a lot of work to be done on a lower level for the community and bring communities together and have the same understanding before we really go into all these aspects when we talk about ai and medicine we um we are going, trying to go a little bit further than 
what you heard from from Frank, which was on medical device software, essentially. And that's, of course, very critical. We try to also cater a bit for health systems management, potentially for public health surveillance and for health research. And um, this guiding star, um, we put it as a star because the WHO principles really, um, they were already shown, are important, of course, they are quite similar in a way to the trustworthy AI principles, but this is our gui guiding star for the work that we're trying to do on developing a, a practical toolbox. I'm coming to this in a moment. Another starting point for our work was also a, a, a joint workshop that was held last year between J organized by JSC and Sen Senelec on standardization, so putting science into standard. And there was one chapter on medicine and healthcare um, um, that we wrote up together with the panelists. Um, and where there's a where we have a, a series of recommendations that touch on mainly on standardization, but maybe also on good scientific practice. I don't want to go into into detail here. This is a very simple presentation of the outcome and the, the main uh, conclusions, basically, I invite you to look at the PSIS workshop report. I would like to emphasize that metrics methodology for bias and fairness, for hidden discrimination, for um, data quality and suitability in view of the purpose, that are, the, are really things we, we're talking a lot about, and we all agreed that this is, would be very, very helpful. Metrics also, by the way, for post-market surveillance uh, at the end of the day. It's a very clarity that there should be clarity how people actually want to measure the ongoing performance of an algorithm. And it will probably also require with AI methods to, to really have a much closer look, I echo again what Frank said, on the post-market sphere. That doesn't mean that the pre-market sphere should be neglected or sloppy, <laughs> not at all, but the post-market, we need to look very carefully there that... Um, an algorithm doesn't deteriorate relatively um, because of new developments that, that we have or just new data quality and the algorithm cannot, cannot cope with that. Now, another point that I would like to make is a study that was commissioned by DG Santé and was published in 2021. Uh, here you see the, the organizations um, uh, involved, Open Evidence, Ernst & Young and Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. And basically what the study showed is what we know to some extent that the AI uptake in the EU in healthcare, not in biomedical research, so there is a lot of uptake already in biomedical research for drug repurposing, etc. But it's slow in the healthcare domain, and they summarize really that some of the that the main three reasons was an absence of a harmonized regulatory framework that addresses specificities of AI systems in health, lack of appropriate enabling environment and a lack of trust and transparency. So there is definitely some work to be, be done on, on the points um, one and, and three. Uh, one will not fall from the sky. I'm coming to this. This is the emerging EU landscape that we have for, for health and um, digital. So it's quite complex with the AI Act, Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, etc. We also have the Products Liability Directive and the AI Liability Directive coming up. Health data use here with the European health data space coming up, the general pharmaceutical legislation, and also data protection, the pieces of, of, of uh, regulation. So complex picture, and we have to be careful that this is still somehow understandable for people and that they are not contradicting um, requirements, of course. That would be um, very counterproductive. You should keep in mind, as Frank has alerted to, the AI Act is a horizontal legislation. It points to different sectorial or sectoral legislation. In the case of healthcare, it's the MDR, the IVDR, the PPR, some uh, smaller directives, so to speak, sorry, um, like the um, radio equipment machinery, etc. So these are relevant for um, managing the Android system. But there are, in a way, gaps because, of course, the AI basically touches on that and hands over to the other regulations. And the MDR is not very specific and it doesn't outline anything yet. So there is really need to develop scientific grounded frameworks. And I'm very happy to see what um, CoreMD has in the mill, um, uh, what is being developed. Another issue is the standardization. That's not going to happen tomorrow. So there are, of course, 
there's an agreement at the moment horizontal standards on trustworthiness should be uh, the, the 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 priority and there is an ongoing discussion actually how to how to um, cater for the sector specific guidance and or standards when that should be done how etc and also of course we have to keep in mind that the usefulness for specific needs of existing standards also needs to be looked at very carefully a lot of the music will play at ISO and Senelec will probably also adapt when it's um, um, appropriate standards according to the Frankfurt and the Vienna um, declarations, uh, as you probably know. So that's an emerging area. And then the other emerging area, to some extent, is um, the consensus-based guidelines. I've designed this slide a bit um, inspired by the nice paper that was done by Alan Frank and many other colleagues, um, the review, which was very useful. And there's a very nice table in that review um, that provides some synopsis on this consensus-based guidelines and shows a bit more in detail some of the, the aspects that are being touched on these. So important is we have already the concept of Spirit AI and Decide AI extensions for the clinical um, trial reports. Trial, trial protocols, etc. Upcoming a robust standard uh, standard tripod AI, and some other aspects. Nice is also the AIM registry for AI and biomedical research, but it's very distributed. Some of the information you have here, then you have something on clinical uh, aspects, and many other papers and principles have been published by many actors, and there's more coming nearly every week. So it's very difficult indeed to keep track of things. And I think that's indeed a problem. So what we what we feel is really necessary is to bring together to some extent the communities of so developers, of so users, operators, sorry, um, health system operators, also regulators, and especially also notified bodies, because they will in the end, at least for the healthcare application, will have a, an important role for the conformity assessment. And to some extent also helps technology assessors because you can design forward processes or also retro design. It's very important also to know for people at the development stage to know what is actually expectation at the very, very end downstream. What do I actually, what information do these people want? And one of the, I think one of the emphasis is that we have, everybody talks about risks um, a lot. That's also correct. But I think what is equally important is really to be very clear and have in mind what are actually the benefits and what's the added value of a system. Because only then will also at the end of the day, a system be not only be able to be in the market, but also to potentially be, be paid for or there will be a commercial interest. So it's very, very important also to make that picture very clear uh, for the developer early on. So in regard to standards, as I said, there are existing ones, but are they sufficient? It's very process centric. It's not very evidence based. Basically, it doesn't help you directly with coming up with what what do I what information do I need to provide. It's not always that helpful. And um, a lot of standards need still to emerge. And it's the issue of the horizontal versus vertical um, relationship. So, in principle, there is a lot of highly distributed information, very horizontal, and we have principles, but not always normative content. So. We felt it would be useful to have a toolbox, provide a pathway for describing AI systems, communicating key elements, and evaluating risks and benefits. And what we're trying to do at the moment is we are basicing, uh, sorry, basing our work on case studies, and we're mainly looking in PubMed, really what's going, what's published basically in the area and in the four or five different fields that I showed you based on the WHO. So healthcare, diagnostics, public health, health research, and health system management. And uh, also at the deployment space where we mainly actually look at the FDA list of medical devices. We then on the basis or in, informed by these case studies, we started to build ontologies for terms, relationships, contents, vocabulary to support communication and clarity. There's a lot of definition issues and what does it actually mean? And we want to bring that together and also show the con connectedness basically of some terms um, because it's not useful to look at one term and forget about how does it relate to other terms. The next element in this toolbox um, is a classification of description matrix. So the OECD has a classification system 
suggested, um, but it's very horizontal. It's for all sorts of applications. And what we want to do is to build something which is more in the health domain that would um, allow to for regulators to have a, a classification of a system, but also if a developer uses that, description description matrix other uh, users or other communities can understand probably much better what are the nuts and bolts of this so it's also about transparency actually and providing a, a helpful grid of that transparency uh, requirements and the last element is a benefit risk pathway so a pragmatic approach for exploring potential benefits and risks already at the concept stage so thinking forward um the ontology is work in progress. I'm not going to into details here, but I want to show you the classification description matrix. We have structured it according to five modules. Here on the left, we have some of the most important sources um, mentioned. I don't go into detail here. So the modules are the system itself, the application dimension, the operators, users, stakeholders, then the data, the training data, where there are training data, the knowledge bases, etc. And last, the algorithm, the model, the relevance, something which is also not always sufficiently um, discussed and put forward. What is actually the relationship between of using that and that marker or that and that um, visual property for predicting something? What is the coherence of what I'm trying to do with the evidence that is out there? That's also very important for every product in, in, in the end that you do. But... I mean, sometimes you have the feeling I'm taking a, you know, people say I'm taking a convoluted neural network, I'm doing transfer learning and it's all right. No. Why do you take that one? How do you do the transfer learning? Why is that relevant for the question you're trying to uh, to tackle? So for the benefit risk evaluation pathway, we have four stages, gains and benefits, adversity and risks, and third, a benefit risk profile iteration that can be done over the life cycle and fourth monitoring surveillance mitigation responsiveness which is one of the principles by the uh, who here we would like to um, put forward the imdf health impact terminology set which we had a, a hand in developing we think that's quite useful as a relatively high description of potential impacts if that's necessary and for the adversity and risk i'm showing you here different sub um, modules basically how we have structured i don't want to go into the details here but this is work in process, but we try to cover basically the, the relevant aspects from the trustworthy, a high level principles and the WHO principles in a pragmatic way. So in the end, what we hope to, to help with this toolbox then and with the um, um, benefit risk pathway is really to help um, across the life cycle to make the life cycle into a pathway for evidence generation and for instance in the planning emphasize the relevance coherence the added value already the design the user research early on who will use that equipment what is the use environment what's the use scenario is it in a hospital is it in private is it mixed who are the operators well, what are the competences you need? What training, etc. Then for the validation, also there is a lot of confusion on trivial things between validation, clinical validation, model validation, user-oriented validation, etc. So th these are things we would like to clarify a little bit there. And then, as I said before, metrics and the close surveillance, which is important, especially for some of the AI tools that are less. Um, less clear maybe i wouldn't call it maybe a black box but they're maybe not 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 the classical machine learning but the the, the the neural networks are much less open basically to immediate understanding so probably we we'll have here a, a need really for more surveillance in the post market and therefore also clear metrics that are put forward that people understand how actually will i as an operator maybe be involved in measuring the performance, the ongoing performance of that system if we, for instance, purchase that from a company. And then really also the real-world benefits for the reimbursement, for the usability, for the use usefulness. And of course, that pathway hopefully can be um, applied over and over this, this process. So it's iterative in principle. And with that, I'm coming to my last slide just to say that um, summing up what I've tried to say at the beginning, maybe start a level lower. Of course, hard explainability, if we can have better approaches of explaining how a neural network 
comes to a decision that would be nice, so there may be new methods, but in the meantime, maybe it's more important to plan ahead, do user research, do real world settings, um, look at the trials, post-deployment monitoring, um, the clinical evaluation that was the main focus of today and metrics and responsiveness. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank also my co-workers uh, at the JRC and also uh, Thorsten Prinz and Hans Werner who are affiliated at VDE in, in Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eva and Claudius, uh, for the presentations. I think that there was quite a bit of convergence about what the three of us were saying, which is always a good sign. Um, I think a lot, as everyone has mentioned, is, is still work in progress and needs to, to really go on. Before I have some um, some questions for uh, my colleagues, there were a couple of questions in, in the Q&A, um, one from Gary McGoran about with respect to conditional release, what conditions do you think would be helpful in controlling these risks? And for example, do you see a benefit for these high-risk AI devices to be released and used solely in a post-market clinical follow-up study or registry? Um, I think that we should try to get the evidence that is needed before release to be to make sure that whatever we do, we're not harming potentially patients. So if it is a high risk, then I think that there should be a clinical trial and that clinical trial can be of different types, let's say. It can be more a, a real typical clinical trial, um, even a, a controlled uh, trial, or it could be more a registry type, but we need to have the information to make sure that there is a positive benefit risk ratio before releasing. The other point is registry type. I think because we're talking about software, there's quite a bit of opportunity to actually record a lot of the use of the medical device while it's being used so that the registry type could be, if you want, built into the tool itself so that we can continuously monitor how devices and tools with AI are being uh, used in real world. Because as every one of us mentioned, there is certainly the potential that the context, the target population might drift or shift during use and that therefore the accuracy of what the system is doing can be uh, different over time and that we need to modify uh, the um, evaluation. Another question was maybe I missed it, but will there be a separate guidance um, or will the MDCG 2021 be modified? Uh, I think we based our um, scoring system on that MDCG, which will be actually be revised probably next year. Uh, and we want to build a specific one for AI uh, medical device software. So I think the answer is dual. There will be a revision and we hope that uh, the, the tools that we are developing within Core MD might be used as a basis for that part of that revision of the MC, MDCG clinical guidance um, to be built into that. Uh, then we have a question from um, Rolf Hansen about transparency and explainability. Do you see a need to explain the AI component or just the functioning as the device as normally expected from a medical device? I see a clear distinction of information expected by patient healthcare uh, professionals and payers. Um, I can only uh, subscribe that and I, I do believe that we do not need for every single device uh, that we use in medicine the full explanation. As I said, and I gave the example of drugs, but I could give a similar example about an MR machine. I do not think that even all radiologists will be capable of explaining the nitty-gritty details of how an MR machine works and how it is creating the images that we're using. So I think that for some of the aspects, we need to test it and test it also, as Claudius was saying, to show the benefit, because ultimately 
Uh, if there's no benefit, then we shouldn't be using the tool because whatever the risk, if there's no benefit, there's no real use for it. And uh, it's not because a tool isn't fully explainable that it can't be tested and therefore can't be, uh, can't be used. And in that regards, um, I'd like to ask the opinion of my colleagues about the famous principle of the human in the loop, which has been brought up uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, I'm personally not convinced that the human in the loop is always beneficial. I can think of circumstances where an AI tool could be working better than a human in certain circumstances, faster, more reliably, more consistent, and that human interference, I would call it in that sense, could actually be harmful. Um, is that something that you have an opinion about, that you agree about, that, that you say, no, the human always have to be, which is now in most of the EU texts, eh, that the human always has to click the button, I agree. My point is, is it always useful and is it always possible? Because if it is a difficult system to explain, what can the human say? How can they acknowledge if it's right or wrong? I'm not talking about the fact that you're using that information to come to a decision with the patient. There, the healthcare provider should be doing that conversation with the patient, but it's really saying this AI tool is correct or not. Eva. Um, yeah, I think it's a, an interesting point that you raise. I really liked the, the presentation also by Claudio uh, that also said, like, maybe take a little bit steps down and like think about transparency i think um i think at the moment it's still like from what i have written uh, read so far it's still um that humans should still be able to override but i think at a certain point probably ai tools will make better decisions than humans because we all make mistakes as a humans um I think it comes back to transparency, also transparency, and to like allow people also like to be transparent. If you go to patients and to say, okay, in this context, it's validated, like for this use, and to also be very honest that we maybe don't always know how it works. But to I think that's really important. If we also think about informed consent and to protect autonomy of people, um, that it comes back down to also that, that basic uh, principle. Um, not sure if I'm completely answering your question, but I think let's start by that to be transparent and honest about what we know, how it works. And if the patient doesn't feel comfortable, he still has a choice. Um, I'm a little bit afraid also, like if we're going to always pick the, the, the side of AI, how it's also going to impact the relationship between healthcare professionals and uh, patients and how it's going to um impact also the credi credibility of healthcare professionals if they might not agree with a system because they don't know everything that the system knows. Uh, I think there's also a possible uh, problem there that we have to think about. Um, but yeah, um, it's, it's interesting. And I think, yeah, we probably all know that in the future, AI tools will make more correct decisions than humans can ever make. Um, For some but, aspects yeah. at least, um, yeah. Claudius, yeah. what is your opinion? Yeah, I think <clears throat> um, what's important, uh, of course, is that humans are humans, and that's beautiful, and it should stay like that. So people get tired, people fatigue. A system doesn't do that. I mean, that's one of the things we should keep in mind. It's it's an opportunity for to use some of these systems, of course, in, in the situations where precisely you don't depend on maybe somebody who has already been eight hours uh, running around um, for patients. So there could be situations where AI is really performing better because it's just not a human. So it doesn't, you know, doesn't need a coffee in between, etc. It doesn't make maybe that mistakes. Um, I think it's important that there is always, in my opinion, in the medical sphere, in, there is the opportunity to opt out. So it, there should never be systems that are arranged like in a chain, arranged like in a chain where there is no way anymore to stop that so to speak so there must be a control button the panic button the, the opt-out must be possible for 
for whatever reasons. And then the other thing is, uh, in my opinion, the, 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 the question is, as usual, it depends. It depends also what is the decision, of course. Yeah, in, in what context, what is the purpose? And if it's a far-reaching decision where a lot of information may be integrated, so let's say it's an imaging um, analysis where you can trust an AI system, but you look over it. But then there are other informations for making a diagnosis on, let's say, a, a rare neuroendocrine tumor view, also depending on other information sources, other biomarker measurements, etc. cetera. Um, you could have a decision system that supports that data integration, but again, a, a clinician looking over this, at least, I think would be very helpful also for the trust simply. I don't think that patients or people are generally ready to hand over that sort of um, important decisions in the end to a machine. Um, and a lot, of course, depends on, again, on the transparency. I I have to say, I, I think the explainability discussion is sometimes, and you got that probably the gist from my presentation, I found it sometimes a little bit hysterical, simply because I, I don't understand what, you know, some people come and say, well, I want to understand how this decision has been taken. Well, I'm not sure I want to understand how, which neural, virtual uh, neural neurons, you know, were involved in a network to make that decision. If I look at ResNet 5 as an example of a convoluted neural network, it's meaningless. What I would like to know is, what were the data actually used for training that system? Is there an algorithmic bias? You know, wh why were these weighing factors chosen if they can be disclosed and things like this? So I would, that's, I think, the, the, the level where we, we need to understand. And we need to also have reproducibility. I think that's more the issue that in an auditing situation, the system comes up with, you know, if you have a specific uh, set of validation sort of data that you can really see, I have a stable type of prediction if you talk about yeah. predictability. System. I so I think it's a very that. complex discussion. Yeah. But of course, I, I always, in this type of discussion, ask the question, how often can a healthcare provider, a clinician, provide all of the reasoning backgrounds and all of the background data for their position that they take towards the patients? So it's we shouldn't ask more of an AI tool than what we're asking today of the humans, what they're doing, and all not the humans are also not always rational. On the contrary, I would say, and cannot always defend whatever their position is by rational background of data and etc. So, we, I, I have problems that we're sometimes asking too much and more of the system than of uh, of of our colleagues. Um, we're nearing the end, and I, there was another question, which is a relevant one, uh, that, um, of course, we focus today, and that was the focus on clinical evaluation, but there is so much foundational work to be done, and I'm very glad that Claudius emphasized that, indeed, on common data definitions, on interoperability, on terminology, data formats, etc. So the data governance is extremely important. Now, that's something where... Uh, the European health data space is trying to work on. There are also several other uh, systems trying to do that, the Eden platform, etc. But it is still something that requires quite a bit of work and attention before we can do it. Because today, a lot of the data not only reside in silos, but also are highly not interoperable uh, to uh, the extent that we would like it to have. So um, we're coming to the end of, of this seminar, this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I would like, first of all, thank Eva and Claudius for uh, participating and for uh, the presentations that they gave, the information that they uh, shared with us. I hope uh, that the audience enjoyed and uh, could have some of the uh, explanations helpful to whatever they are doing in their practices. Uh, but the bottom line, I think, in all that we've been saying is that we're progressing, but that there's still quite a bit of work to be done, and that it's an extremely fast-moving field where a lot of things are happening and technological uh, changes are occurring, but also the legislation is still not, uh, let's say, clear or completely finished. So there's a lot of open things, but it shouldn't preclude us from trying to 
progress. So again, thank you to all. Thank you to Jean-Baptiste Rouffet for uh, the organization of this webinar. And uh, I hope we'll see you again on the upcoming webinars from CoreMD. Thank you very much.